welcome you guys. Would you stand with us? We're going to begin with our worship tonight. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Can somebody hit the lights, please? Um, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We say yes to what you're doing in your heavenly realm tonight. God, we just want to partner with what's already taking place in your kingdom realm tonight, Jesus. There's worship and praise encircling you, Father, where you are. And we just want to join with the sounds and symphonies of heaven tonight. Jesus, have your way. We put our attention on you. Come in, invade, take over this space. Surround, engulf, press in, we are ready. High, deep, wide, and out. We rise up, we bow down. Kingdom come, come on, kingdom now.
come to yield to you. We make space, we make a room. How we long to be close to you. Yeah. How we long to be close to you. Sing a brand new song And I will scream at the top of my lungs I will praise Him for all He has done I will praise Him for all He has done On top, on top of the mountains I will run, I will run Ever singing praises for all you've done, all you've done. On top of the mountains, I will run, I will run. Ever singing praises for all you've done, all you've done.
and declare he's worthy tonight lift it up over this place lift it up over this region prophesy with a sound tonight it's not just about what's happening in this room but what are you releasing in new england right now we declare your goodness god we declare your sovereignty you are worthy lamb Yes, ro ro kiri andoro se, rese kiri andoro ro kori andoro si. Seated high above, lifted up, His name above all names. High up. 
above all principalities and powers. This is my God. And throne and glory and majesty and light. He's the bright and morning star. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh. My God is a God of war. Hey. Pushing back darkness. Let the light in. Let the light in. Swing wide, you can. Again, come on, worthy. 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 Worthy is the Lamb. High above all principalities, powers, rulers, authorities circumstances of life there is no God like Jehovah there is no God like you Jesus Yeshua the anointed one the one with fire in your eyes even for this gathering tonight Lord you're jealous for your bride so receive the reward of your suffering here tonight Lord as these shining ones lift a sound to you and you are now enthroned upon the sound of the cloud that we release in this place God and I can I say it's not just about what we do in this room but it's what we declare over this city over this region oh God over this nation oh God over the world oh God all hail King Jesus all hail Emmanuel oh God with us you never leave you never forsake always faithful grace sufficient love enduring there is no end to our praise there is no end to our praise tonight so on the count of three, I want to release one more shout unto God. Find that space of thankfulness. Find that space of victory. 
And if you can't find it, step into a place of faith and call something that you don't quite see as though it is fully manifest in the now. It's victory in Jesus. It's the one who on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's the one on the cross who said, it is finished. Chains broke off that day 2,000 years ago. Life rose up that day 2,000 years ago. And here we are today, 2,000 years later, because of what you did, Jesus, 2,000 years ago. There is victory in Jesus. So on the count of three, one, two, three, lift up a show. Slap your neighbor and say, God is good. I mean, high five. Clarify. <laughs> how many of you here were last? Were, how many of you were here? Uh, I complete sentences goodly. How many of you were here last night? Amazing. Thank you guys for coming back. If you weren't here last night, we do urge you to watch that or listen to that teaching. Uh, it is, as a matter of fact, Pastor Manny who was here last night from Restoration. He said it was uh, one of the best teachings he's ever heard in his life. So I encourage you to get into it, to dig into it. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, if it's your first time here at the bridge, we welcome you, your first time family. We don't do visitors here. We just do family. We hang out. It's what we do. This is not a conference. We're just hanging out, and Ken happens to be here. So um, we just open the doors, and we worship, and we see what God wants to do. And so uh, we're really excited, and I just want to say you guys are radiant. You guys are beautiful tonight. Like worship, like you guys were just, you guys were the worship leaders with the worship leaders. You were making a joyful noise, some of you. It was amazing. So give the worship team a hand. They were amazing. So we talked about it last night. I'm not going to talk much about it tonight, but uh, on September 15th, beginning on the 15th, uh, so Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we have prophet Dr. Bernard Taylor. Uh, recently, about 15 of us actually went to a meeting that he was at at Pastor Manny's church, and he is humble. He has three doctorates. He knows the word, and his prophetic gifting, his words of knowledge gifting is the most accurate of anything that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and so that's one thing, but the reason why I asked him to come, aside from that I felt like the Lord was asking me to ask him to come was because of his character. We've seen tons of gifting, but it's his character. He's a humble man. It's, it's almost weird for me. But uh, so we invite you, encourage you to come out. We'll send out some emails. Um, if you're not on our email list, you can go to our website at the bottom of the, the front page. You can sign up for that. Uh, we don't spam you so much. Uh, we just let you know what's going on. So uh, that is good. And other than that, I think we're ready to roll. We'll receive an offering for Ken a little bit later, if I remember. And uh, we'll do that. Ken, are you ready? I guess the practical things is Ken's getting settled. If, if it is your, your first time here and you're new to the building, it's really not a big place. It's just kind of a big square, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so if you need the restrooms, you just go down to the hall, take a right at the end of the hall. Ken's product table is in the back, and it's, it's being depleted. So, you know, everybody bum rush the table at the end of the night. <laughs> or something, I don't know. Stretch out your hands to Ken. Ha <laughs> ha 
<laughs> God, we welcome my friend, this father in the faith, this apostle in the faith. And as much as I've always wanted to greet him with literal blue smoke and silver trumpets, <laughs> so badly want to do that, but we, we stay in our lane tonight, God. I try. We thank you for this joy from you that is our strength, God. We thank you that we're, we don't take ourselves so seriously that we can't just stop and laugh for just a moment. But above all things, God, I, in this moment, I thank you for family, for this kingdom family that is in this room tonight. I, you just feel family when family gets together here in New England. And there's family here tonight. So we welcome family as family. Nothing less. I thank you for that spirit of adoption that you've given us that has transplanted us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of your light. And that you've marked us with royalty. But with that, we also bear the responsibility of royalty. And so we lean into you tonight. We choose to lean into you through your word, even as we have pressed in in worship. I pray a refreshing on your son, Ken, a greater infilling for today and for the season to come. And corporately, we speak a blessing over him over his wife, his children, and down through the generations. Shalom. In Jesus' name. Would you give an awesome New England welcome to soon to be Dr. Ken Fish? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Although, in the scope of, of normal living, it, not as quite clear yeah anyway okay um so i just want to get myself set up here because i was participating in the prayer time so give me just a moment here it was great worship i agree Teresa. it was really good it's so wonderful when you can get to that place of breakthrough in worship um all right so before we get going, we have merchandise on the table. Lisa's minding the table. Uh, we, I didn't know this, but Greta held back four copies of my book. This is one of the four. Um, I'm, I'm waving at you, you know, so that if you wanted one or weren't here last night, I would not recommend waiting till the end of the service. I'd just go back and buy it now if you want it. Um, it's available elsewhere. It's not like, you know, we're running out here, but... Uh, we sell it on, in the Orbis online store, and we can ship to you if you don't get it here. And we have it on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com and everything. came out in June. For a period of time, I don't know exactly how long it was, because to be honest, I wasn't really monitoring it that carefully. I know a lot of people do this sort of thing that I'm about to describe, but I, it's just not my way. I just don't do that. But there was a period of time right after it came out where it was number five on Amazon in all spirituality, whatever. Anyway, I don't know if it's that good, but somebody thinks it's worth buying anyway. So you can decide if you decide if you buy it and read it. Um, uh, I have with me um, somewhere, it might actually be here, uh, what are called book plates. These are like inserts that you can put in the front of a book. So if you buy one of the four and you want it signed, I'll sign it for you. If you want to buy one and we don't have the book, but you still want to buy it and you buy it from us, I'll give you a book plate with a signature in it. You can stick it in there. It usually passes just as good in the collectibles market. I don't know if this will ever be collectible. <laughs> it might end up being firewood for somebody or something. But, but anyway... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I can sign it tomorrow. But, but I, will, I will tell you this. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be pretty uh, constrained on the back end. So I don't know how much ministry we'll do in the morning tomorrow, only because I have a flight I have to catch. 
but uh, anyway, yes, happy to sign it tomorrow. So here you go, Greta. And Oh, Lisa's got her hand up. Yes, Lisa. Oh, you sold three. That is the one and only copy right there. Greta, you're about to get tackled. <laughs> yeah, charge. As I say, it's not, like, it's not like you can't get it someplace. It's just this is the only one in the building right now. So there you go. Sorry? There you go. Thank you, Blesley. <laughs> Blesley's one of the TAs in my uh, school, and she's an intercessor uh, for me and others, and um, she's uber prophetic. So anyway, if you don't know Blesley, you should. She often comes along um, when I come up here. She'd drive up from New York City where she lives. Okay, so... I think I'm ready to go. Yeah, that's going, and we're ready. All right, I want to I share with you tonight, on the, we're talking about this breakthrough, uh, general space, the space of breakthrough, and I want to share with you tonight about something that is a major impediment to people's breakthrough, and it's not just a major impediment. It's, for the most part, an unrecognized one or an unknown one. And so those are the things that really bite you, or the ones that you don't even see coming. And so if you've got Bibles, um, however you have yours, uh, open, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture that need to be read in parallel to subsume everything we're going to cover tonight. The first one is found in Mark chapter 6, and the second one is found in Luke chapter 4. Mark 6, Luke 4. So... Let's read the word of God together. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 1, tells us, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went, out, he went about among the villages teaching. Now, that's our first passage. But with everything in Scripture, context really matters. And one of our big problems when it comes to understanding the scriptures is that we often don't really think carefully about the context. And that's somewhat driven, not entirely, but somewhat driven by this thing of chapter headings and chapter breaks and verses. And so I read the part that I want to focus on, but I want to give you backstory to this so you will understand a bit more about what is happening. And so we're actually going to back up now to Mark 5, and in Mark 5, Jesus has crossed over uh, in the boat to the other side. And it says in Mark 5.22, Then came out uh, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Now, in a synagogue in that time, you would typically have uh, the leader of the synagogue, the, the rabbi who was in charge. But there would be uh, what amounts to a council of elders who were the rulers, and they, they took care of... Um, administration of particularly the scrolls so that was very important because the scrolls were sacred and uh, they took care of kind of just the administrative aspects of the building so Jairus is one of that leadership team and he falls at his feet and he implores Jesus to pray for his daughter who's at the point of death and he says come lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live and he went with him and then it follows this interruption and the interruption is actually one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Many people don't realize it's an interruption. Jesus is on his way to pray for this girl, and the woman with the issue of blood comes up. And we don't know exactly how long that exchange takes, but, but it's a delay. It might have only been five or ten minutes, or maybe it was 30 or 40. I mean, it's just hard to tell from the passage. But the point is Jesus is stopped in going to Jairus' house. That is clear. And so um, while he's engaged with this woman who has come and touched him and been healed, the little girl dies. And so 
it says in verse 35, while he was still speaking there, uh, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead, don't trouble the preacher any longer or any further. But overhearing what he said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Now, note that they laughed at him. We'll come back to that, but I, I want to highlight it right here. So they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. Now, who were the ones who were with him? Peter, James, and John. Got it. Okay, so Peter, James, and John. So he's got five people with him, mom and dad and the three disciples. That's it. And he goes in to the girl's room. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is Aramaic, and it means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. And then follows what we already went. He, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. Now what Mark is doing is he's creating a juxtaposition. He's talking about, on the one hand, Jesus raised a little girl from the dead. Now, she hasn't been dead long, but, but you know, they're, they're, let me just say this, because this, this message is on the anatomy of unbelief. That's the title of the message. And there is an unbelief that is that's ubiquitous in Western lands, including in Boston, Massachusetts. It, it, it's, it's ubiquitous. And we often don't realize how it works or why it's so insidious. But what Jesus did when he dealt with Jairus' daughter is, the Bible doesn't use this language, I'm using our modern language to describe this, but what he has done is he has created, as it were, a microclimate of, of faith, a microclimate of belief. Because when he gets to the home of Jairus, as it happens, there are people there of mourning and, you know, hangers-on, well-wishers, probably members of that very synagogue that Jairus is associated with. That would have been part of his key community of, of friends and faith. And when Jesus says, oh, don't be worried, she's just asleep, they laugh at him. Laughter, in this case, is not a good thing. It is a symptom of unbelief. And so Jesus realizes he's got a problem with unbelief that he has to overcome, and he doesn't say, oh, Father, open the heavens and make the angels come down and clear out all the unbelievers. What he does is he himself clears out all the unbelievers. He says, no one can come in here except Peter, James, and John, and mom and dad, and beyond that, everybody get out. I don't know if he said it that way, but that's what he did. Okay, so he's created this microclimate of faith, and it's in that microclimate of faith, that little bubble, now, how big, how big does the bubble need to be? Well, homes in that day were generally not that large. If you go to Israel and look at some of the ruins, you see that these homes had pretty small rooms. In fact, for, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that at least for some, I don't know about this guy, he's a synagogue ruler, he could have been better situated. But at least for some, a home might be no bigger than this entire section of seats. And so... He doesn't need a very big zone, but he needs, he needs some kind of a bubble of faith in order for this miracle to occur. And so we get a raising of the dead, a resurrection, and it, that is juxtaposed to the fact that it says he could do no mighty works in his own hometown because of their unbelief. Now, they weren't so much laughing at him. Unbelief can have many faces to it. It can look like, who is this guy anyway? I mean, we know who he is. He's, he's the carpenter's son. We know all of his brothers. We know his family. We know his history. And, and it's also, my mother used to say, familiarity breeds contempt. Contempt is a symptom of unbelief. And not only is contempt a symptom of unbelief, but let's just say that in the background of their minds, everybody knows the story of Jesus, that he was conceived before nine months <laughs> after the wedding. And so there's this kind of thing about him that, 
oh yeah, he, he's that guy. I mean, well, at least his father did well by his mom and married her instead of running off like so many people might do. Uh, but they couldn't, they couldn't keep themselves from each other. And, you know, in Boston today, or in Los Angeles, where I live, nobody would really think twice about it. Yeah, people get married, you know, they get pregnant out of wedlock, and, I mean, they shouldn't be doing it, but, but people just sort of ignore it routinely. But not in Jesus' day. Not in Jesus' day. This was considered a, a, a serious faux pas. And there were all kinds of reasons, from ritual purity to, um, to just the fact that they didn't have birth control. There's all kinds of reasons why you didn't have sexual relations if you were somebody who was respectable prior to marriage. Again, we don't really think this way anymore. I want to suggest to you we'd do well to recover that thinking. But... But that's a different sermon. And so when he's, when he's speaking, they say, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? Because we know this guy. He's a carpenter's son. Carpenters don't talk this way. How did he learn all of this? And, and with it, there's, there's a kind of an offense or maybe a little bit of a, what, what in Australia they call the tall poppy syndrome. Somebody kind of gets ahead, rises up above the peers, cut the poppy off, lest it appear to be taller than all those around it. And certainly in Jesus' community, there appears to be some piece of that small poppy syndrome going on. And then they are talking about, well, we keep hearing about these miracles, including, by the way, a little girl that was just raised from the dead because word travels fast in the hill country. And so we keep hearing about things that this guy does, and they took offense at him. Offense. Not laughter, but offense. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And so he could do no mighty work. Now the word mighty work in Greek is the word dunamis, and it is the word that most commonly is rendered... Oh, look at that. It's right there on the screen. Isn't modern technology amazing? <laughs> Uh, the word dunamis in Greek is commonly rendered as miracle. He could do no miracles there. So what Mark is telling us is he did a miracle there, but he couldn't do it here. And the difference between the two is there he created the microclimate of faith, but here he could not because of their unbelief. That's an interesting thing because you might think, Jesus, why didn't you just take uh, Peter, James, and John and do your thing? You don't have mom and dad of the little girl here. But do your thing and, and re basically replicate what you did back at the synagogue ruler's house. And the answer is he couldn't. That should make you ask a question. Why not? Okay, with that, let's go to Luke 4. So Luke chapter 4. And the passage we're looking at starts in verse 16. And it reads this way, same story, but a different uh, take on it by Luke. And he came to Nazareth where he had brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Aha, new piece of information, this is on Saturday morning. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Now it's not clear if this was on the lectionary or if he requested Isaiah. We know that Jesus had a particular affinity for Isaiah. And we actually talked about that with the prayer team today about how Isaiah is a very important book to familiarize yourself with, with which to familiarize yourself. And so the scroll is handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This all comes out of Leviticus 25, or it's based on Leviticus 25. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. There's the offense right there. Luke doesn't use that word, but they're, they're staring at him, and they're basically saying in their minds, what chutzpah? How could this guy even say that? And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And when he says that, now they're speaking well of him. So there's, there's like an ACDC current moving here. And they all spoke well of him and they marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, 
is this not Joseph's son? So we're back to, isn't this the carpenter's son? How can this guy say these things? Why is he saying these things? How is this even working? And a moment ago, they were th- they saying good things about the gracious words, but a moment before that, they're kind of like, who is this guy? So you can see it's gone bad, it's gone good, it's gone bad. This is the oscillation that goes on in the heart of unbelief. Anyone here ever struggled with it? Okay, two honest people in the room. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Now it doesn't tell us about Jairus, the town in which he lived, but possibly he was the synagogue guy down the road in Capernaum, which by the way is where Jesus has ended up settling upon his return from the Jordan River where he was baptized by John and then in the wilderness. So maybe there's something about an overlap here that's being referenced to the Mark story. Because remember, the raising of that little girl from the dead immediately precedes this account in Nazareth. And you could easily miss that juxtaposition, and it's very important to the story. And so he says to them, yeah, well, you're saying what you did in Capernaum. We want to see that here. Show us what you got. Now, maybe they're saying it aloud or muttering it, and he overhears it, or possibly he, as it were, reads their thoughts because there were places where he did that with the Pharisees. The scripture isn't clear, and I'm not going to make a claim either way because I think one of the most dangerous things preachers do is to make claims that aren't clearly tied back to the scripture. So it could have unfolded either way, but the point is somehow this issue of Capernaum and things you've done elsewhere comes up. And he says to them, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Same language as we saw in Mark. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, and there were many lepers in the land of Israel uh, in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Okay. Wrath equals unbelief. Okay, just to be clear. Wrath equals unbelief. We're looking at the anatomy of unbelief. We're looking at body parts of unbelief. We're looking at faces of unbelief. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. Now this is in fulfillment of the Mosaic law. But can we just all agree that if someone wants to throw you off a cliff, they are not your friend? Okay. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. All right, well, so this is our scriptural underpinning for what we're discussing tonight. And the backstory to this message is relatively recent. I just wrote this message a month or so ago, and I've only done it a couple times. And uh, I've only done it once in the United States. So it's, uh, it's not one that you will have heard before. But I was, uh, not too long ago, I was talking with a friend about the differential anointing that exists between the U.S. and other countries. Now, this person has been on ministry trips with, you know, various ministers and um, has done different things. And, and to, can, we, can we just be clear here? We're not talking about those ministry trips where you go and, like, play soccer with kids and build homes. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just she's been on ministry trips that are oriented towards signs and wonders and mass evangelism and things like that and she's seen major breakthrough stuff so we were talking about this she and her husband and I and we were you know kind of kicking this around and so she was talking about something that was coming up in her city and she said um so will it be U.S. level or we'll just say XYZ country level anointing because it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about you know, whatever, this country in Africa or that country in South America or this other one in Southeast Asia, it's kind of the same phenomenon. And what we commonly see, and because she's a U.S. citizen, she said in the U.S., but I would broaden it to say Western lands level anointing. Australia, Canada, England. Is it going to be that level or will it be, you know, this other part of the world? And it's a fair question because anyone who travels in ministry knows that this differential exists. And many people ask about it and uh, many scratch their heads over it. 
Now, just as a further kind of knot in the, in the wrinkle or in the story here, uh, back during the years of the Australian outpouring, when I was going to Australia maybe six, seven, eight times a year, keeping Qantas Airways in the black, and uh, you know, I was seeing uh, dramatic outpourings around the country, some of the accounts of which are in the book that, I guess, Lisa, do you still have it? She has the one copy left. Uh, there are some accounts in there, but honestly, I'll tell you, when I sent that book to publication, the editors took out some of the more astounding stories because they said, no one will believe this and you will compromise your own credibility with your readers, so we have to take these out. No, legit. Yeah. So this unbelief thing, is a, it's a non-trivial issue and we don't realize how big it is, so I'm kind of addressing the elephant in the middle of the room. But you didn't take them out, right? I did. I was told to. I was required to. They said, we won't publish it with these stories in. Some of the, some of the more dramatic stories, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I'm a first-time writer and you don't get to choose sometimes. There's a whole reason why self-publishing is not a good thing. But that's off topic. Okay, so I'm talking back during those years with this friend of mine who's been a mentor for many, many years. Um, my wife and I were more or less under his and his wife's tutelage for, oh, I don't know, quite a while back in the vineyard era. And, um, and he and his wife have remained good friends of ours through all these years. And uh, he's one of my intercessors and really just checks in with me every so often with words from above and just wise counsel. And, uh, and at that time, I had a lot of people in Australia saying, hey, why don't you just move here? And, and I didn't really... Let's just say this, I like being a U.S. citizen. I didn't really want to move to Australia, although I love the country and I love the people and the Lord's graced me there. But, uh, so I was talking with him about this, this matter of should I or should I not move there? And he said, you should definitely not move there. And I said, why is that? And he said, because if you do move there, what will happen is you'll become old hat and suddenly the favor you enjoy will go away because a prophet is only without honor in his own town and among his own people. And as soon as you become a local, all of that's going to go away. And I was like, well, what if I'm living in Melbourne and I go out to Perth? He goes, well, okay, maybe on some level, but they'll view you as an Australian. And so that which you bring with you will diminish. And I was like, wow. Now, there were other reasons besides that. Just to be clear, why in the end we didn't make any effort to move to Australia. And again, it's off topic. I could tell you about it, but we're just burning valuable time, so we won't go there right now. But anyway, I thought it was an important observation that this mentor friend of mine made about this matter of honor. All right, well, so let's unpack the story of what happened in Nazareth. So let's start with this. Jesus followed the principle of honor by returning to Nazareth. He, he was not, from what we can see in these passages, he was, he was not viewed universally with good eyes. He had this reputational taint over him based on his birth. Um, his parents and his family would have had to kind of live with that always a bit around. People more or less get over it, but, but every now and then those sorts of things, if you've ever been in a family or a community where those sorts of things are in the background, they may go away for three or four or five or ten years and then all of a sudden they flare up and there it is facing you again. And so Jesus would have had to deal with that there. Um, but notwithstanding the fact that he had left Nazareth and moved to Capernaum, that's provable from Scripture. And I think he was trying to get out of that very environment. He went back there to honor them because they were his people and that was his hometown. And so we can say this, he followed the principle of honor, but they didn't. And so he shared as he came into the synagogue, he shared with them a prophetic word. He literally delivered a prophetic word to Nazareth. Now, he didn't do it in the conventional way where you think he'd stand in the public square and say, the Lord says to Nazareth. He didn't quite do it that way. There are many ways to deliver a prophetic word, and any of you who have had any prophetic schools or classes know that one way you prophesy is you get a scripture and you prophesy off of that scripture. It becomes the catalyst of it, and you deliver the word, and then maybe you put the modern spin on it, which in Jesus' case was what? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But he brought the word of the Lord to them 
as a prophet and delivered it. And I don't think most people that teach on this passage in the modern period get it. And for sure what happened was when he shared this word, which was a prophetic word, by reading the scripture and then beginning to unpack it, when he did that, they refused to receive the prophetic word. And that's why you see this oscillating effect in their attitude toward him as he brings that word. Now, if you're a prophet and your word is not received, generally what's going to happen is the grace that you can bring to those people will be released, uh, will be diminished. And it will be diminished or reduced, was the word I was about to use. Uh, it will be diminished or reduced. Why? Because if you receive a prophet because he is a prophet or in the name of a prophet, then you receive a prophet's reward. But if you don't do that, you will not get the prophet's reward that they bring with them. That prophet's reward is a blessing that's attached to the ministry. And it's designed not only to bring traction to the messaging of God, it's also designed to provide provision to the prophet. It's designed to bring a blessing to the town. I mean, this is the nature of the way these fivefold graces work. And it's true of all five of the graces, but it'll look a little different depending on whether you're a prophet or an evangelist or an apostle or whatever you may be. All right, so it says that he could only lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. So he did some healing. But one of the things that you have to understand about um, revival culture, and more broadly than that, and probably more importantly than that, not just revival culture, but, but the, the realm of the supernatural, is that there are actually levels of breakthrough. And not everybody is, is at the same place at the same time. And even from what I've seen, one area, one zone, one geography might be a domain of greater breakthrough than another. A lot of it's tied to this issue of honor and unbelief. So I know there's at least four levels of breakthrough. There might be more, but I know about four. And I can show them to you, and I'm about to describe them to you. The first one is this matter of healing. Now, a lot of us say, man, I'd just be happy to get a few people healed. I mean, we're struggling to get the breakthrough on healing. Fair enough. We do have to, however we do, we got to get there. And by the way, tomorrow morning in the sermon, I'm going to talk about breakthrough praying because they, we're talking about breaking through into purpose. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that idea, but I'm not going to do it tonight because, again, I'm trying to keep this message a little more contained than last night. We'll see how I do. <laughs> okay, so healing is level one. Level two is miracles. And we saw miracles immediately before this moment in Mark chapter 5, when Jesus went to Jairus' house. And so miracles are a higher level of breakthrough. They're more dramatic, um, they, whatever they are. And, and they also tend to do things like violate what we think are the laws of nature. Broken bones knit instantly. Dead people come back to life. People walk on water. They appear in locked rooms having gone through walls, apparently, or dropped through the roof, or whatever they do, but there they are. So the, this is level two. What is level three? Well, level three and four are both described in the book of Acts. And those of you who have heard me talk about catalyzing regional outpourings in the past um, have heard me talk about this. But in level three, it says, uh, Acts 19.11, God was doing extraordinary miracles. So there's miracles and there's extraordinary ones. And extraordinary miracles in, in this particular story mean that handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul's skin were carried away to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, why is that one extraordinary? I'm not entirely sure I can describe why, but, but at least it's some form of a distance healing. Paul's not laying hands on them. And, and so there's a separation and that makes it somehow different. But Luke clearly uses the word miracle. And so I think when it's talking about diseases, I think we're talking about, you know, healings of things that are not healable. So maybe cancers or ALS or, I don't know, whatever, paralyzed people, etc. And then, then, of course, evil spirits are coming out. And a lot of people believe, not everybody does, to be clear, but, but a lot of people believe that linguistically miracles... Um, and deliverance fall in the same category biblically. 
So miracles may not merely be walking on water or changing water into wine or anything like that. Deliverance itself is a miracle gift because it's a power against a power, a dunamis against a dunamis. All right, so Paul is at level three with these remote healings that are going on in Ephesus. And then level four occurs in 1920, also of the book of Acts. And so this is right after they burn all the scrolls and there's a mass deliverance among the believers. It says they were believers and they came now and they burned their scrolls in the sight of all and the value is 50,000 pieces of silver. And it says, verse 20, and so the word of the Lord continued to increase and to prevail mightily. Now at level four breakthrough, what's happening is all of the above, levels one, two, and three, or everything below if you want to make it a stack, but anyway, all of the preceding is true, and you get this massive breakout of the gospel and of the kingdom of God where people just literally, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's like, you know, if you've ever seen footage of, you know, when, it, when a battle's going on and the entire front line just collapses and it turns into a rout. And so the kingdom of God is routing the kingdom of darkness. And it goes on and it says in this Acts 19 area that as a consequence of this immense kingdom breakout, uh, what ends up happening is all of the province of Asia Minor hears the word of the Lord in two years. That's a massive full-scale blitzkrieg by the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness with many hundreds and thousands coming into the faith. Now, I've seen moments of this in my travels. Uh, we have one account in the, uh, in the book where we went to an island in Indonesia and based on a few people getting healed, there was a massive breakout and in one night, the entire island came to faith. Everybody just cleaned it up. So it can happen, and I've seen it happen. And I've seen it happen similarly in some villages down in Mexico when I've been in the Yucatan Peninsula, primarily among Mayan peoples, not the mestizos that are the half-breeds of the Spaniards and the locals. But these are pretty much pure-blooded Mayans that just kind of, they just there left over from centuries ago. So levels one, two, three, four, healing miracles, extraordinary miracles, and then I don't know, breakthrough or breakout or whatever you're going to call it. So Jesus is healing in Nazareth, and, but he says he laid his hands on a few sick people. It's not even clear if these were particularly extraordinary healings. It may have been sore backs and colds. And I mean, if you've got the cold or the sore back, you appreciate that. But that's not quite the same thing as some of the other remarkable healings that we see in the scriptures. And so Jesus is giving what he has and the principle for us, the one that we want to take away from this, as people who are going to be people living under purpose, that was our message last night, is you give out of what you have and you expect that the more will come because he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much or more. Now a lot of times when people are trying to function in these dimensions of the kingdom, it's like they want to start out up here like David Hogan putting the heads back on 13 severed bodies. Well, that's nice. It's aspirational. Probably isn't going to happen. You got to start down here and as you're faithful with this, more is given. Does that make sense? By the way, Jesus lived this principle himself in John 5.20. He says, even greater works... Uh, than I've been doing will I do in order that you may marvel the father loves the son and shows him everything that he is doing and so with that Jesus is, ex is expressing in John 5 20 the idea that I'm operating here but I'm expecting to go higher even as the son of God even as the son of God so this is a binding principle on all humanity and I don't think a lot of people realize that one and so there's a, there, there's a lot of people that are waiting around for, as it were, their ship to come in in ministry, <coughs> I would say, get busy doing what you have right now. And as you do that, that's where the more will come. Because that's an important part of breaking through. All right, so the second thing we can say about what happened in Nazareth, the first one was that Jesus followed the honor principle. The second thing is that the people of Nazareth, they physically recognized him, but something had changed since they'd last seen him. Something had changed. And that's why they're saying, where did this guy get all this stuff? Who, who is this guy anyway? I mean, we know who he is, but this ain't the guy that we knew. 
And so, as I said, their familiarity bred contempt because they actually thought they knew who he was, but they didn't know who he was. And so they regarded him after the manner of the flesh, after natural knowledge. And Paul even uses this language in his letter to the Corinthians, henceforth we regard no man or woman after the manner of the flesh. Now what does that mean, really? It, it means that the way unbelief works, because that's our, that's our topic tonight, the way unbelief works, it will cause you to think of people as less than. Because you think you understand them and you have them figured out. And I'll tell you what that looks like in Western society. Put a label on it and now you think you understand it and you can dismiss it. Donald Trump is a hothead. Okay, done with him. Joe Biden is losing the plot and he's got dementia. Okay, we're done with him. Both would be foolish to do. But do we do this all the time? Yes. In fact, it's blood sport in, in modern American media. This is what we do all the time. And by the way, I picked both of them so that no matter which side of the aisle you're on, you can be offended. <laughs> and I'm not partisan. So they regarded him after the manner of the flesh, and they took offense at him, and they particularly, most particularly, took offense at his allusion to the widow of Zarephath and to Naaman the leper. And the reason they took offense is Jesus is telling them, you guys are asking for miracles, and yet you don't even realize the endemic unbelief that exists among you such that, and it's, by the way, been here for so long because Elijah lived in the 9th century B.C., and Elisha's a little later, maybe into the early 8th century, but it's been here so long that, in fact, in prior times when God wanted to do great miracles through prophets, he couldn't find a place where he could do it, and so he had to send his prophets to deal with people who weren't even the people of God. And with that, we see that the people of God are almost more guilty of unbelief than the unbelievers on the outside. That's what's going on here. And what Jesus is doing is, Mike Bickle uses this, well, he doesn't use it much anymore, but he used to use it a lot in his preaching. God offends the mind to reveal the heart. And what Jesus was doing was he offended their minds on purpose in order to show them where they were positioned and why he couldn't do the very miracles that they wanted to see. And he said, this ain't the first time this has happened in Israel. Have you guys ne learned nothing? He didn't say all that, but he was saying all that. That's what's going on here in the dynamic. And so they failed to understand the presence and power of God. They failed to understand that when Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, he meant, I'm carrying the Holy Spirit like one of the prophets of old. And when he said, he's anointed me, they didn't, they didn't take it at face value that he's actually anointed me, and he's given me a particular commission to preach and minister in this particular way. They didn't recognize that, and they dismissed the word that he brought them. And here's one of the, one of the other things that deals with breaking through. is It's similar to the idea of faithful in little, faithful in much, but it's actually slightly different, and that is if you are faithful with the first level revelation, God will open the gateways of revelation such that you will get a higher revelation right behind the one that was the initial revelation. So the first revelation tests you so the second one can come, and if you're good with that second one, there might be a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You don't know how many dimensions God is waiting to open, but if your heart is closed with unbelief and contempt, then what will happen is nothing at all. And that, if you understand what I just said there, that right there explains a big chunk of why we don't see level XYZ country anointing in the USA. Because, well, let me just hold that thought. We'll get to it, so don't worry. But they failed to understand the presence and power of God that were in their synagogue resting on Jesus that were in the word that he gave them, albeit read from a scroll and then articulated rather than as the prophets of old standing in the city square with your hand extended. This was kind of how prophets tended to prophesy in those ancient times. And, and he did it a little bit differently, but, 
but they, they dismissed it. They didn't accept it. And what they did not understand is that the presence and the power of God are drawn to expectant faith, expectant faith. And one of the things I learned in the years of the Australian outpouring is this, and I, I actually turned it into a tagline that I used to use, expectation is the combustible fuel of faith. When there is expectation in a room, in a stadium, in a whatever, a church, it doesn't really matter. When you run into expectant faith, it's like turning on the natural gas in a kitchen, blowing out the pilot light, and letting the natural gas fill the kitchen, and then come in at some point afterward and strike a match, one of those old-fashioned matches, or get a lighter. And when you do, what happens? Boom! Expectation is the combustible fuel of faith. They had no expectation. Who is this guy? He's the father. He's the carpenter's son. We know who this guy is. He's been around here for years. He wasn't that good of a carpenter anyway. The doors always squeaked. The tables weren't level. You put a little round rock on it, it'd roll off and fall off the end. I don't actually think Jesus had that problem, but you get the idea. That sort of narrative, right? Oh, yeah, he's born to Mary with that ridiculous story about an angel. Yeah, of course an angel came and appeared to Mary, right? We, uh, yeah, we know how that works. All of that conversation, all of that backstory, all of that regarding after the manner of the flesh, that's all in the air and the water and the food supply of Nazareth. And so there's no expectation when he shows up. And prophets, as he said, and others who are sent by God, are commonly disregarded by those who know or who knew them in an earlier time in another setting. And so the offense that they it explicitly says they took, this is the unbelief, and it's what's causing miracles not to occur. And so unbelief is more than simply, I don't believe, although it could include that. For sure it could. I don't want to bypass that at all. So if you've got someone in your family who says, I don't believe any of that Bible stuff, that's unbelief, for sure. It's legit unbelief. Or if you've ever been reading the Bible, or maybe you once went to a church where there's a passage and the pastor goes, well, we all know this isn't really true, and then went on with the sermon. I mean, there's plenty of them around here. There's plenty of churches in New England that preach that way. PDG doesn't, but, but, but that's why we're here. Right? And, but I'm just being a realist here. So unbelief is not merely I don't believe, it's more, I can't believe that Jesus is doing this. It's more like, you know, why doesn't God send us a real prophet instead of this dude? He never did that before. So when did things change? And it says Jesus himself marveled at their unbelief. So they're marveling at him, and he's marveling at them. It's a mutual astonishment, albeit for different reasons. So what we can say about this picture that I painted for you is that the unbelief in Nazareth was not merely Nancy's unbelief. I'm just picking on her because she can see her. I'm not calling her an unbeliever. I'm not calling her out. It's not Blesley's unbelief. It's not Teresa's unbelief. It's matrixed unbelief that is interlocking and mutually reinforcing, and it becomes a web or a fabric within the society, and that, my friends, is the United States of America. And so here's a... <laughs> bring out the scissors. <laughs> I love it. Did you say that? <laughs> Yeah, if only it were that easy, as Debbie says. That's right. So, because we are Americans, and we are a highly individualistic people, sociologically, this is just the way our society functions. Everything is about me and my breakthrough, or my job, or my, 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 my. Because that's the way we function as a people, we don't understand the, the sociological dynamics of what happens in a society that is more tribal. Because even, even as Americans, there's an aspect of what we do that's quite tribal. All I need to do is say Red Sox versus, say, Yankees. And you instantly get it, right? Suddenly you went tribal and you stepped away from your individualism. Or Patriots against the Giants, right? Same thing. Boom, you're immediately out of your individualism and you're in your tribalism. 
So this kind of matrixed unbelief becomes reinforced, self-reinforcing, and the entire narrative of what goes on in a civilization begins to reinforce it. And it becomes almost impossible to breach through it. Not even Jesus could get through it as the anointed son of God, and he could do no mighty miracles. So interlocking and feeding upon itself is what matrixed unbelief looks like. And it wasn't a single person's problem. It was everybody's problem. And in fact, Nazareth was a town steeped in unbelief and founded upon a foundation of dishonor. That's a big statement. Why, do we, why, why can we say that? Well, because in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, there's a story of a man named Nathaniel. And Philip, who's one of the early apostles, he's traveling with Jesus, and they're down in the south. They're down by the baptismal site near the Dead Sea. And um, they go and they find Nathaniel. And Philip comes to Nathaniel and he goes, Hey, come see the man that Moses wrote about and that all the prophets spoke of. We found him. And Nathaniel's like, I'm in. Because on the one hand, he's a religious seeker. And and then Philip drops the kind of the, there, there's, here's the good news and here's the bad news. He goes, his name is Jesus from Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel's from Cana. And if you don't understand the geography of the Holy Land, you would miss the fact Cana is just down the road. I mean, it's like an hour's walk from Nazareth. So in the hill country, in the days when people don't have cars and everything's on foot, or maybe donkey, I mean, it, this is just, this is the neighboring town. And... So what does Nathaniel say? He goes, Nazareth. Just what Teresa said. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so there's a reputational taint around Nazareth. There's this sort of, really? Come on, give me something better than that. And Jesus actually draws upon this very issue when he talks about none other than the prophet Jonah. And he says, as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the whale, so will it be with the Son of Man. He will be three days in the earth. All right, but, but what else is there about Jonah? The reputational taint. Because Jonah came from a town called goth And goth it's almost like a little triangle. You've got Nazareth, Cana, and goth Affair. goth Affair is a little closer than Cana is the right way to say it. But Cana is the way we all say it. So they're all kind of up here. But, but this one here... Cana, it kind of has its own little world. It's not tainted the way that Goth Affair and Nazareth are. And so the idea of Jonah and Jesus actually aligning with that, why is Jonah a problem to them? And why is this district a problem to everybody? Because Jonah was a prophet. It says in the book of 2 Kings that during the reign of King Jeroboam II, not the early one in the time of the split of the monarchy, but later on, King Jeroboam II, Jonah was a court prophet. He prophesied and sat at table with Jeroboam. And the scriptures tell us that as long as Jeroboam listened to what Jonah told him, his kingdom thrived and prospered. Because he brought the word of the Lord, and because it was met with faith, he got a prophet's reward, and the nation was increased. And then the scripture says, and now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise and go to that great city, Nineveh, and cry out against it. And initially Jonah's like, screw that. I'm not going to Nineveh. So he books passage to Tarshish, 2,000 miles away. He runs into a little problem. God redirects him back towards Nineveh. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches... But here's the thing, and it's not in the Bible, but it's easily provable historically. Jonah ends up going native. He dies in Nineveh. He never returns to Israel. So he's like the prophet gone wrong, prophet gone mad, who goes off in this direction and does this thing, and everyone in Israel is like, the Ninevites destroyed us, and he went and lived among them. And so with that, there's this idea Nazareth, Gath Affair, their neighboring towns. Jesus is a prophet. Jonah's a prophet. Nothing good comes from that area. That's what's in the heart of Nathaniel. And that's what's in the heart of all these people. That's the nature of the town. It's the nature of the territory. 
it's once you see it it's very clear but most of us don't read the scripture with this level of texture and depth to capture that dynamic and so the people of Nazareth had been under this taint since the time of Jonah. By the way, how do we know that this happened with Jonah? Well, because when ISIS rolled into the city of Mosul, Iraq, in 2015, once they had taken the city, the very first thing they did was go to the tomb of Jonah and blow it up because they were trying to wipe out every vestige of Judeo-Christianity in the area because they were trying to establish the caliphate. So you can no longer go to the tomb of Jonah because it's been destroyed, but you can watch on YouTube, you can see pictures of the tomb of Jonah, and you can watch it go up because of what ISIS did. So there's, there's um, archaeological data, which is now only video, but, but there was archaeological data, that proves what I just told you about Jonah, and it ties down all of these loose ends about this reputational problem. All right, so the people of Nazareth, they've got, they've got some problems. They've got three of them in particular. Number one, they knew Jesus' family and his family history. We've kind of talked about that, and that familiarity bred contempt of him. And so the reputation, as I've already suggested, was that he was the bastard son, or at least the illegitimately conceived son, of the carpenter and his fiance, and they thought they was better than he was. And they regarded him after the manner of the flesh, as I uh, suggested. And similarly in America, America thinks it knows Jesus. But it has actually forgotten who he is. In America, we use Jesus as a swear, room, swear word. In America, people say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they don't go to church. And it says that Jesus' custom was to go to synagogue. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to go to church. And the scripture points to this in Hebrews, as far back as the first century, we had people who said they believed and didn't actually show up for worship. But, but it's actually part of the honor principle. You're going to honor God, you go to his house of worship and you worship. And you should do it regularly. I mean, you take a vacation or something, okay, fine. But the, the norm in America today is for people who are committed Christians to go once a month. That does not cut it. All right, so... As a, result of, as a result of this um, problem they had of knowing him and his family, they didn't honor him, even though, as I said, he had come to honor them. So Nazareth and all of the environment around it, including Goth Affair, had this checkered reputation, and we already unpacked for you how Nathaniel dismissed the very idea that anything good could come out of Nazareth. So Nazareth was something of a, we could say, a hard scrabble little town, um, on the edge of a cliff, no less. Uh, with people who are of no particular repute. They were rough cut, perhaps a bit coarse, uncouth, and vulgar. That was the kind of reputation that Nazareth had. And Jonah had come from just a little bit away, about two and a half miles. And as I said, he went native when he went to Nineveh. And so the reason people marveled at the gracious words coming out of his mouth, we remember that verbiage when we read it? The reason they marveled at the gracious words is they're like, how could this guy speak this way? We don't talk this way around here. We're more dismissive. We're more, you know, we, we run people down. We have jokes that sort of take shots at people. And, and, and this guy's come to honor us? What, what is this that's going on? So that makes that piece of it make sense too, doesn't it? Well, it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so their lack of graciousness, the endemic culture of Nazareth, was indicative of the entire environment of the town. Now think about the way America is today. There might be a root right in your own life that needs to be repented of because you've participated in the blood sport of American discourse. And it might be part of the thing that's blocking your breakthrough because you don't realize that your mouth is an open sewer. And I'm not just talking about profane speech. Remember Isaiah in the temple, Isaiah 6, 1 to 6. It's a very famous story. Everyone in the room probably knows it. I don't need to turn there. But when he sees God in the temple, he says, Woe to me, I am ruined or I am undone. I myself, I'm a prophet, but I am a man of unclean lips. And I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I live in a city, this one, Jerusalem, that's matrixed with unbelief. 
And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And what did that matrix unbelief do? It kept Jerusalem from repenting at the words of the prophet Isaiah. And if you read the book of Isaiah, he goes on and on. He has many different things he says. But one of them is they keep on seeing but not perceiving. They keep on hearing but not understanding. This is America and this is the American church. It's also the Australian church, the Kiwi church, the Canadian church, the British church, the German church, the French church. Anything in the West is, is marked by this. And the way you can know it is by what people are discoursing about. And I said last night when we were talking about Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from out of your mouth because you are meditating on it day and night. And the, and the lack of scriptural discourse among the people of God today is prima facie evidence that we are overtaken with unbelief, just like Nazareth. I just said a lot there. And so the conditions in our country show that we are not honoring the Lord, just like in Isaiah's day, just like in Jesus' day. The third problem the Nazarenes had is they didn't recognize or acknowledge the anointing that was upon him. And I've pointed at that, but let's unpack that idea, and we're just about done with the sermon. They disregarded the prophetic word that he gave them, as I said, but maybe it was because it came in a package they didn't expect. They thought a prophet should prophesy this way, and he did it that way. John had come wearing a camel's hair cloak and eating locusts and wild honey. Jesus didn't do that. He came, he came feasting, not fasting. He drank wine. John wouldn't. So they, he was a totally unexpected package. And with that, they missed the hour of their own visitation, as he himself would say, as he wept over Jerusalem just before his death. And in, in, in the moment that he was in Nazareth, what they didn't get is he read the word off of the word, he delivered the word off of a scripture, and they thought it should be something else if it were truly legit. And so they were tempted to negate what he said with a quip. Oh, yeah, <laughs> physician, heal yourself. And again, Jesus discerned this, however exactly he did it. And when he explained that previous prophets had been sent to people who would believe, they tried to kill him. What's the equivalent in modern America today in our public square? Let's eliminate him from all of our national discourse. I remember the day, I'm old enough, I remember the day when presidents prayed as part of their national speeches. I remember when scripture passages, I mean it was, it was light and weak, but, but they, would, they would incorporate passages of scripture and try to buttress some of what they were doing with the idea of Christianity and it was because they were appealing to what was believed to be a Christian people who were generally more religious than the president but but they were you know there was at least that attempt we haven't seen that in a while Kennedy did it yeah he was a Catholic um, I think Trump had a few in his speeches Biden's done none of it Obama did none of it um, I think the last president who really did any degree of it was actually Bill Clinton but and maybe George W. I can't remember what W. did or didn't do, but he kind of wore his faith on his sleeve, so he probably would have. But anyway, you get the idea. You can even see the devolution, not evolution, but devolution uh, within America in this direction. And so Jesus said, you know, that the Lord sent prophets to people who would receive, people who had that expectation. And with that, things would combust, things would go off. And so He's really answering their question. The reason there's no miracles, guys, is because all of you are people of unbelief. And if you want to know where God will send people and do miracles, he will do it among people who believe whether or not they are Jews. That's basically the message Jesus is giving to them. And so in all of that, among those people, there was an endemic lack of familiarity with the ways of the Holy Spirit. And I would say that that is true of America today. An endemic lack of familiarity with the ways of the Spirit. Now in contrast to that, think about what Moses prayed when he was on the mount with God, Exodus 33 and 34. He says, show me your ways. You tell me I've found favor in your sight. Show me your ways that I may find favor in your sight. And I've read some legit Bible commentaries that say, well, Moses obviously didn't really understand. 
because he prayed for favor in God's sight and God had already told him he had favor in his sight. So Moses was an idiot. They don't use that word, but they are dismissive of him. But what Moses is really saying is, if I've found favor in your sight, teach me the next level of your ways. Teach me the deeper truths, the things that maybe I'm insensitive to now, maybe the things that aren't being taught or thought about. Teach me those things so that I may go, whether you want to say higher or deeper <laughs> or broader with you, I don't care which way you say it as long as you have that idea of that expanding domain of favor, in order that I may find more favor with you and so God says, well, the very thing you've asked I will do, my presence will go with you. And that's when Moses says, all right, now show me your glory. And so there's a, there's this, this is contemplated in the life of none other than Moses. But Moses was really asking God, show me the ways of the Holy Spirit. Teach me his ways. Because if I know the ways of your spirit, then I will walk in a way that will be pleasing to you. And in America today, I would say both in the church and out of it, there is not only a lack of knowledge of the ways of the Spirit, but oftentimes even a contempt toward the ways of the Spirit. And in the church, you know what it's wrapped up in? It's wrapped up in this kind of language. It doesn't matter because God loves me no matter what I do. It was all done at the cross. That's part of the anatomy of unbelief too. Because people who are professing the name of God, their hearts are actually hardened toward the ways of God. What did Isaiah say? This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Who quotes Isaiah? Jesus. This people honors me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. And so the anatomy of unbelief includes that hardening, that contempt towards the things of God, the ways of God. And so if you understand everything that I've told you, this collectively, in a nutshell, is why we see fewer miracles in the U.S., why we don't see massive crusade breakouts like you do in, whether it's Indonesia or, you know, pick your favorite African country, Malawi or something. This is precisely the reason why we might rename the United States of America Nazareth, USA. No offense to those who live in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, but. <clears throat> now, when unbelief takes root, and then again, I've shown you multiple facets and faces of unbelief. When unbelief takes root among a people, uh, it, it, it has various ways of infiltrating. And I want to close with this story that occurred in New York City. And as I remember it, Leslie, I think you were there. I think this was during COVID when we were meeting at Bethesda Grace's facility, I think. Uh, but it wasn't that long ago, maybe three years ago now or so. Um, so we have a bunch of people in the room. They are uh, predominantly Ivy League graduates, whether undergrads or graduate level. And um, so this is a ministry that works with, with Ivy League graduates. And I'm speaking to them, and there's a couple hundred people in the room, I think, um, from memory, it was around that. And I, I don't remember what I was teaching that day. I wasn't teaching this because this message hadn't been written yet. But I, I was teaching whatever. And I got to the end of the message and I said, now we're going to have a ministry time. And um, the Lord's going to deliver a bunch of you. And uh, I, I, I saw the leader of the, of the house uh, kind of lean over to somebody next to him. I couldn't hear what he said, but he told me later. He said to the guy to whom he spoke, uh, he said, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> so I said, a lot of you are, um, you are infused with unbelief. And even though you're all born again Christians, this was not a crowd where you'd be doing any evangelism. You, even though you are born again Christians, you are infused with unbelief and you don't even realize it. And I said, and there's four specific things we're going to go after. So the first one is atheism. The second one is agnosticism. Uh, the third one is uh, skepticism. And the fourth one is Malthusian economics. And so I'm going to unpack those for you. So atheism is about what it sounds like. There is no God. And you say, well, why would Christians have atheism problems? And then I, I answered the question for them. I said, the, the, the lecterns and 
you know, speaking, uh, speaking rostrums that are in uh, Ivy League classrooms are themselves bully pulpits of atheism. And many of you were, were badgered and buffeted with atheistic teachings as you went through school. You may have held on to the ragged edge of faith, but, but you were really challenged in all this. And some of you went backward in your faith, and you've never really recovered. You've been weakened, but perhaps you managed to stand without completely capitulating. And it's reflected in various aspects of your own spirituality, your walk with God, and so on. And I said, so atheism can be a problem even for Christians. And I, I, by the way, learned this when I started doing a lot of ministry in China, and I had to drive out spirits of atheism from Christians. Why? Because the entire overlay of communist doctrine is atheistic. And I would, I would say that in America today, we are not much better than communist China. We have a different economic structure. But at the official level, what goes on in our public schools, what goes on in our best in class universities, and even the ones that aren't the best in class, that are just local public schools or, you know, uh, what do we call them? Um, community colleges. All the way right up and down the line, everything is that way. Think about those of you who are teachers or who work in government offices. You barely, barely dare mention that you're Christian, lest you be fired for doing it. So we are not really much better than the communist Chinese right now. We think we are, but that's part of the issue of regarding people after the manner of the flesh and not realizing the culture of dishonor and unbelief in which we live. So I said, so those of you who have um, atheism in your hearts or who have struggled with this since college, I want you to come up. Next category, agnosticism. I said, this, these two are somewhat similar, but agnostics will say, well, there is a God but I don't, you can't really know very much about him. You, and by the way, we don't even know if him is a him. Him might be a her or an it or whatever. Nowadays they say they. God might be polytheistic. I mean, there's, just, there's so much confusion. That's all part of the agnostic complex. And I said, some of you are Christians. You're here because, I don't know, you like the people, you like the singing, you like the, <clears throat> you like the ethos of what we are, but you don't actually share our heart and belief. And so you need to get delivered of agnosticism. And the third category is skepticism. Now that one's a little bit different, but skepticism is this thing that questions everything. And in America today, we don't believe in our politicians, we don't believe in our preachers, we don't believe in anybody. And not only that, we have this other thing, and it's endemic to our culture again. When, when I go to place, someplace like Indonesia or Thailand or Malaysia or when I'm in Uganda or Tanzania or Rwanda, places like that, if, if somebody has, say, a morsel of food, and they say, oh, Paul, try this. You're going to like this. It's really good. They'll say, well, thank you, brother. And they take it, and they eat it. In America, if I say, hey, try this. You're going to really like it. What do we do? We take it. We kind of look at it dubiously. Does this have any gluten in it? <laughs> any soy? Any milk products? This is, the, this is what it looks like in U.S. culture. And you're all laughing because you know I nailed it when I said what I did or did what I just did. So skepticism... I won't believe it unless I see it myself. You've got to prove it to me. All of that kind of thinking has un eroded the, the concept of trust and with it the idea that I can take somebody at their word. But I'll tell you something. I'm going to pick on Blessley. If Blessley tells me something, I don't question it. I just take it at face value. Because I know Blessley's a trustworthy person. She's my friend. She prays for me. We have a standing relationship. I know Blessley would never stab me in the back, and I know that anything she tells me, she has researched well enough to be able to, you can take what she says to the bank. But see, in America, that sort of confidence in anything or anybody, even your spouse, is basically out the window. And we are taught all of that through our educational process. And then the fourth issue was Malthusian economics. Thomas Malthus was a British economist. He lived during the Enlightenment. 
And in the early 1800s, so roughly 200 years ago, he was alive in the late 1700s too, but anyway, in the early 1800s, when the population of the earth was not yet a billion people, and just by the way, comma, right now the population of the earth is just over 8 billion people. We crossed that boundary in November of 22. So the population was less than an eighth of what it is now. Thomas Malthus said the world is running out of resources. And so we need to control population. We need to have zero population growth policies. It becomes the foundation of the eugenics movement, of the assisted suicide movement, of the abortion movement. It also becomes the foundation of the scarcity movement, that there isn't going to be enough. We're going to run out of, fill it in, timber, oil, and by the way, the atmosphere is no good anymore either because of global warming, and so the earth is going to burn up under the sun's heat. This has gotten so bad that last week, I, in my news feed, another story came up about global warming, and it, I was waiting for it. I knew it had to come sooner or later, and it finally, it, maybe it's been out there before. I hadn't seen it till last week. It said global warming is an extinction-level event for the human race. We are on the verge of all of us dying out. And, but, but actually, you know, the people that are kind of of that mindset, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Get rid of all those useless eaters, and the earth can revert to what it should be with just animals and amoeba and go on with its evolution. All of that comes out of the teachings of Thomas Malthus, and it has to do with economic scarcity and whether God will provide. And if you wonder whether this has anything to do with the anatomy of unbelief, think of the words of none other than Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount. Consider the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as one of these. If God so clothes the lilies of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of? Wow, there it is. We just sealed the deal. So we called people up for atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and Malthusian economics. And <clears throat> all heaven broke loose, and most of those people were hanging over chairs, crawling on the floor, uh, vomiting in buckets, coughing, retching, getting delivered left, right, and center. Do you remember that meeting, Leslie? I mean, it was a holy mess. <clears throat> and it went on until they kicked us out of the building because it wasn't a suburban church in an office park like this. In New York, you rent buildings by the hour, and when your time is up, it's up because the janitors have to come in or the next group is coming in and there's no run over. So they literally pushed us out of the room and we were dragging people into the elevators because they were unable to function and taking them down to the street as the meeting ended. Now just the, the, the epilogue to that and then we're done with the sermon. Uh, a few weeks later I got a phone call from a reporter with the New York Times. And the reporter said, I, I heard about the meeting that you led in New York, and I'd, I'd like to write a story on it. And I said, well, it depends on what you're going to write. So we had a bit of a negotiation up front. And, um, and then we talked about the events that I just described. And so the reporter you know, took notes and did what they do. And about two weeks later, the reporter called me and said, um, we're not going to be able to publish that story. He said, I thought you were very credible, and I went and checked with some of the people that you suggested I speak with and so on. He said, everything checked out. There was nothing that, that didn't work, but my editor will not allow this to go to press. We can't have a story about you know, 200 Ivy League graduates getting delivered of demons in New York City. That's why you never read that story. Either that or you don't read the New York Times, but it, either one would be a reason. So, but, so I've shown you the anatomy of unbelief. I've shown you what it looks like biblically. I've shown you why it shut down Jesus in the flow of power. And if you're having this problem of unbelief and you're living in that matrix of unbelief, it will keep you from breaking through to purpose because your own faith will not be fully operative and engaged with the very purposes of God that he has on your life. Instead, you will shrink back because you'll be operating in some dimension of atheism or agnosticism, skepticism about whether the prophetic word or the Bible verse you read or whatever, however God spoke to you, might have been an angelic visitation or a dream, but whatever, you'll be operating with that, and you will live in this, God will never provide for me to do that, and so you're caught in the world of Thomas Malthus as well. And so you need to get free of all this 
if you're going to break through to your purpose. And that's the end of the sermon. Shorter than last night, PDG. Shorter than last night. By 37 minutes. But no, not quite. About 20. About 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. That was a good pastoral close, though. I think he started closing 20 minutes ago. So. <laughs> that's a Paul Kane close. That is. That's right. But in closing. So now that you clapped, we want to give you an opportunity to sow. And, uh, man, we just, we so love and honor Ken, and we love his, his wife and his kids, and just had some good times over the years. And uh, so tonight, again, if you're making out checks, you can make it out to the bridge. Uh, you can text Bridge Metro West to the number 94,000, and we will send you a list of links, one of which is to give. You can scan the QR code on the back of the chair. And there's probably envelopes back there, so you can do cash. And uh, cash is good. it still works, you know. In some places. In some places, right. Yeah, that's true. In some places. Father, I'm so thankful for your word. And Jesus, we honor you as the word that became flesh and walked among us. And your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword to divide between the issues of the soul and the spirit. Your word is living and it's truth. And it transcends every circumstance of our life. And so tonight we choose to sow into you primarily, into what you are doing still and will continue to do on the earth. Jesus, you are the head of the church. And as the head of the church and the son of the living God, as the one who's been given all authority, I'm pretty sure you're going to have your way. So we lean into you tonight with expectant hearts, trusting you with your purposes and choosing this day whom we will serve and whom we will co-labor with in the coming days. Bless this time. Bless this offering. Bless those who give. And I so trust that kingdom dynamic that you release on a people who operate in radical generosity. Let your glory fall in this room and let it pour forth to the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Back to Ken. So I, I didn't include the punchline on the Tem Thomas Malthus, which is the population of the world was less than a billion. We're over 8 billion now. We haven't run out of food. We haven't even run out of oil yet. We thought we were going to back in the 80s, but somehow we got past that one. And here's why, because God always gives us what we need. Now, sometimes it's provided through human ingenuity, scientific breakthroughs, whatever. We get more yield per acre or whatever it might be. It depends on the unique thing we're discussing. But we've, we've got 8 billion people on the planet, and there's enough to feed everybody. There's enough to house everybody. The only time that there's shortages is when people are hoarding or there's supply dislocations caused by people who are trying to take outsized profits from the market. It might be corrupt rulers or governments or whatever who don't distribute the food to their people. But that's a different problem. That's not that there isn't enough. It's that there are corrupt people interfering with all of it. So we've got to come back to that position of faith, of confidence, of expectation. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, I'd like the entire prayer team to come up tonight. Um, and you know who you are. I asked Greta about this. I think it, you were in the meeting this morning. Um, so if you're on the prayer team, I want you to come on up to the front to pray. We're going to need people on this side, too, so don't all of you go to that side. 
Now, some of you who have just come up may be thinking, why am I coming up here? Because <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go after these four things, atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and Malthusian economics. If you 